Welcome and thank you for being here. We are so grateful to you for joining us tonight and for being part of our community. My name is Elric Walker. I'm a board member of the Jung Association of Western Massachusetts. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little about the Jung Association of Western Massachusetts. We are a mostly volunteer organization founded in 1996, concerned with promoting and exploring in community with others, the ideas of the great depth psychologist, Carl Gustav Jung. I'd like to take a, a quick moment to introduce you to our board members and also to the members of our advisory board and to thank them for all their good work on behalf of the association. Christine Olson is our president and fearless leader. Penelope Tarasuk and Erica Lorenz are current board members and advisors, and they're two of the longest serving members of the board. Erica uh, previously served as our president. Both are authors and practicing Jungian analysts. Judy Hall is our bookkeeper. Um, one moment, please. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Judy Hall is our bookkeeper. Judith Breyer is our secretary and also helping with fundraising and hybrid tech. We welcome Dan Hathaway and Peter O'Brien as our newest board members. I serve as public relations liaison for the association. We are also grateful to the members of our advisory board, author, poet, and depth psychotherapist, Dr. Edward Tick, psychologist and therapist, Dr. Carol Beauvais, retired family therapist and historian, Peter Williams. These last three that I mentioned um, have all served on the board previously and continue to serve on the advisory board. And Joe Coolen, who uh, some may know as the former publisher as of the Parabola magazine um, and recent children's book author. Joe also serves on the advisory board. We thank them all for their many ongoing contributions and for their much sought after sage wisdom. Many kind thanks to Andrew, who is here tonight uh, providing Zoom and technical assistance. Upcoming on Friday, May the 3rd at 7 p.m. on Zoom, we will present what will be the last lecture of our uh, current season series. Randy Morris will speak on the therapeutics of extinction anxiety, a depth psychological approach. In the description of his presentation, Randy says, I want to make the claim that apocalyptic imagery and extinction anxiety are promptings from the sentience of the earth herself, inviting human beings to walk through a threshold toward personal, cultural, and planetary renewal. Jungian depth psychology offers a therapeutic frame of reference to understand how to navigate these rough waters with courage resilience, and with grace. So please join us the first Friday in May, May 3rd at 7 p.m. For more information about upcoming lectures about the Jung Association and its members, and for access to recordings of past presentations, please visit our website at westmassjung.org. And now, without further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Erica Lorenz for an introduction to tonight's speaker. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I want I want the gallery view. Let me get the gallery view back. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm glad you're here. I'm here to introduce my friend and colleague, Lori Larson. And I've known Lori for a number of years now. I can't remember how. She's a wonderful visual artist, and she does process painting, which is active imagination with painting. And it's I've seen some of her paintings, and they're absolutely powerful and rich and stirring. And um, Lori has always loved Egyptian mythology. And in 1978, she went with her family for the first time to Egypt and fell in love with the images. And when she went to Pacifica, she was trying to decide whether she wanted to be, go into mythology or become an analyst or a therapist. And a Pacifica um, uh, professor who was an analyst and taught about Egypt, Walter Odinick, really turned her on to Egyptian mythology. So she started to follow this train of the fem fem masculine and the feminine. And in 2014, she read a poem, What Did You Do?, which she will read to us, which, which really um, pushed her into this life. And then while researching ancient images of the masculine and feminine archetypes, she ran across a papyrus of the Book of the Dead, which is actually translated as the book of going into going forth into the day, is what it really is, of a, a priestess. And her heart was being weighed by Mott, which is what we're going to talk about, the feather. And her heart was being weighed at, after death of whether she was going to go into the afterlife or not. And she she crossed um, she was found to be true of voice, so she crossed into the afterlife. In 2018, and this turned her whole dissertation in the direction of this particular piece. In 2018, she got her PhD at Pacifica, and she says, this is the wave, the Egyptian mythology, I'm going to ride for the rest of my life. In November, I had the wonderful privilege of going to Egypt with Lori on a trip. She wasn't the guide at that point, but she was my guide and many of our, our guides. And we would be in a tomb or a pyramid and she'd say, Erica, come look at this. And she would just go into incredible, story. she's a wonderful storyteller, story and detail of the hieroglyphs and the images and what the goddess was doing to the Pharaoh and all this amazing stuff. I learned so much from her. So that's why I really wanted her to share this with you. So I will pass it over to Lori and she will take on a, us on a trip to Egypt. And I hope she will really sometime. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> May have to do lots of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome. I hope you are all safe. I know a number of you are on the East Coast, perhaps even in the New York area, and I've been keeping track today of the unusual occurrence of an earthquake, and I just heard there was a second one here about an hour ago. So uh, I'm, I'm sending hope and blessings to all. And I want to now share my screen, and we will begin the slideshow. So... Here we have the title, it's Mott's Wisdom, Harmony, Balance, Order, Joy, Truth, and Justice. And I wanted to start with a presentation outline so that you guys kind of know where I'm going as we go. Uh, we're going to start with an invocation. It's a practice that I developed during my dissertation that I found uh, that I absolutely essential to my uh, ability to truly connect to these energies. Before I began that, I was keep I was really disembodied, and so it really helped me there. And then the poem that Erica references is going. I'm going to recite that for you, and um, and you will feel the power of it. I do not doubt at all. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that impacted me. And then we'll start the full presentation of Maat and her people and um, end 
The last part of it is some of my most recent um, research that I am being drawn to, and that involves the work of Nathan Salent Schwartz that is just so impactful as I continue to look for the ways that this ancient culture can bring uh, wisdom to us. And we'll then finally end with a Q&A session. And so let's get started. Okay, if you'd all just take a moment, perhaps shut your eyes. Let's all take a couple of deep breaths, me in particular, <laughs> and come fully present. Beloved Mott, inspire our hearts to remember your wisdom. May these words and images, stories and myths that I share tonight help support and renew each one of us. Guide our bark into the deep waters to retrieve sparks of enlightenment from these cultural treasure troves. To hear, to see, to feel these tales and images for the benefit of reconnecting the three realms, the divine, the terrestrial, and the ancestral. And to clean up our house of life and reweave the beautiful tapestry by showing us how to live with awakened hearts. Blessings to the companions and the bark, bountiful gratitude to you for these writings that you carved into stone and that you painted onto papyrus that convey your wisdom teachings. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started failing as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? And this beautiful poem is by Drew Dellinger and it's called Hieroglyphic Stairway. When I knew, it was 2005, and I was standing on the top of the Continental Divide on Trailwood Road with my children, looking out over vast thousands of acres of forest that I was very familiar with since my childhood. And I saw thousands and thousands and thousands of red rust-colored needles on the pine trees. A bark beetle infestation spurred on by warming winters and lower precipitation had killed as high as 90% of the trees in the forest in one summer. My teenagers and I got back in the car and drove down without speaking. What could I say? In 2014, when I first read that poem, I was just getting ready. I'd finished the coursework, I'd taken a little break, and I was just getting ready to start my dissertation research. I had my proposal, I had my chair, I was all ready to go. And that poem I read one morning, early morning, and my heart broke open. And that memory from 2005 and a number of other experiences that had come in the years between, came back flooding into me. And that last, what did you do once you knew, kept echoing in my heart as I tried to proceed forward. And I realized that if I'm going to spend the next two to three years in this in-depth researching and writing, I had to do something relevant, something that would make a difference. 
And so I started searching for that and just leaving myself open. I studied with an eco-psychologist, Dr. Lori Pye. I, she became the chair, the new chair of my committee because my old chair said, I really don't want to chair a, a dissertation on this topic. And so I reformulated everything and moved forward. And this is something that has become a passion for me since then. And why I landed on Egypt after finding that papyrus, I knew I had to learn to read the images, not so much the hieroglyphic signs, but the images I wanted to understand, like this beautiful image in front of us. What are they saying? Because I knew image carries much more weight. Jane Ellen Harrison told us all about that back in the early 1900s. And I am a firm believer that we can get so much out of the images. And all of a sudden, there it was, Egypt. We've got to go and figure out what this language is and what it's telling. So that's how I got to Egypt. And it has been an incredible journey. And as Erica said, this is the way I'll spend my life writing. So I put together a little thesis statement for this particular uh, presentation. And it's in these really challenging times, we can look to the ancient Egyptians and their culture, and particularly their goddess Ma'at, to find hope, resilience, and the roots of renewal for our own time. And what made them so compelling for me was that they endured. When I start, I always start studying the culture from their history, what we know of their geography, what we know of everything about their culture. And especially going back in ancient times, that's imperative for me to get a feel. I want to be able to see through their eyes as much as I can. And I realized they endured all the hardships that we're enduring. They went through ups and downs, lousy leaders, invasions, pestilence, plague, and they kept coming back. They had an incredibly resilient cu culture. And, uh, and they did that for over 3,000 years. So I realize this is significant. So who is this Ma'at? We see her on the far left here. She's got her beautiful turquoise ring, wings spread in a sign uh, gesture that means protection. She's wearing her feather, which in this case is black. It's usually white. And she's seated behind uh, two other goddesses. The image that started when I gave you the, the uh, presentation outline is the the woman whose tomb this is, her name is Nefertari, and she is at the head of this image, making her offerings. It's a daily activity, the great devotion. I learned, I use three things to help me connect with Mott, and I just want to go through them quickly. I abandoned the traditional uh, Egyptological uh, uh, thing to... Um, sorry, I forgot a word, convention, uh, to refer to Mott as an abstract concept. Got rid of that. I put her name in caps and a, and a gendered pronoun so that I could relate to her as I was reading my text over and writing. And I felt that imperative. They didn't respond to their gods and goddesses as uh, uh, abstract concepts. And I started each day with rituals, invocations, candle lighting, trying to uh, embody what I was seeing in their writing and in their images. And then I engaged in creative processes like active imagination, journaling, visualization, meditation, process painting, all of the ways that I know to connect with the deeper layers of the um of the unconscious and creativity, bring the creativity up. So I had a dream, and I'll tell you the dream. It was a short one. Mott came to me in her wild cow form, 
The forms of the goddesses are very fluid. They didn't set up dogmas or hierarchies. And she came out of a cave to greet the dead. And she had her graceful horns with the vermilion sun disk and two beautiful plumes rising up behind it. And I heard this resonant message. Until we realize that the gods and goddesses are multiple perspectives, holoscopic, they don't come alive. They are like a kaleidoscope composed of all the same elements, but with changing patterns that express the differences endlessly. And this was such a graphic, beautiful message. I'd been trying to sort out how do I make sense of, of over 250 deities and how do they interact and why are why is that one wearing that one's headdress and and this just put it all into the succinct because they had the belief, the one, their pre-creation state, the, the great abyss called the noon, is, is imbued with deity. How can it not be? And its name, when you translate noon, means all and nothing. So they embodied it right there. And as the creator God, they have over six creation myths that I know of. They break the, the gods and goddesses come out as generations for differentiation so they can understand, get a greater thing. So that's when I realized that word holoscopic is so critical to understanding their thing. And I looked it up. It's actually two words put together, Greek, Holo, meaning whole, and scopic, meaning scopen, the watcher, the one who watches. And that's what they did. They were great observers of their world. And I realized uh, that through this dream and through working with their beautiful imagery and poetry, that what they valued more than anything was the awakened heart. The heart for the ancient people was often considered the highest intelligent. The Greek or the um, Egyptians were very aware of the discursive mind. They used it. They kept con made contracts, legal documents. They established the first nation state with over 600 miles from north to south of administrative needs, and they uh, so they used the discursive mind, but. The awakened heart is the doorway into their mysteries. So here's a little collage just to give you a sense of how varied the deities can show up in their beautiful imagery. So up in the upper left, we have the wild cow. She's sitting on the hieroglyphic symbol for the noon, for the water. She's also known as the flood, the great flood. She's the primordial creatrix. At the front of her is the Horus, the falcon bird that is her child, and that she sees as the being that she carries between her horns above the flood waters up into the stars. Kneeling in front of her winged is Newt, and Newt is of the uh, third generation, and she's the sky goddess. Here we have the eye. And you often hear, you're probably familiar with the eye of Horus or the eye of Ra. It is uh, referred to in that way as a masculine, but what the feminine does, it's like the Shakti, where she in Hinduism, where she is the creative, protective, she's the active participant in the duality of the masculine and the feminine. And the eye is one of the primordial beings who was plucked from the forehead of the great he-she creator uh, called a tomb and was sent to find the children, the second generation that had gone missing in the black noon, the abyss and the inert water. And she was premier. She, when she returned, a tomb put her back into the forehead and said, you will be the most powerful of all. So she has lots of uh, autonomy and uh, goes forth and takes care. And then we have here the tree of life, 
within the tree of life is a Hawthor newt, and she's offering bread and fresh water to the newly deceased. This is Nitstita Nebet Tawe. I love to say her name. And she is the priestess, her scenes. She has 15 scenes that I found. It was a collection of uh, papyruses that were discovered and, and uh, a man published them in the 1950s in black and white images. I've seen the original at the Cairo Museum. And the bread and the water, all food, all offerings on every altar are ma'at. So then we have this beautiful image of ma'at being offered to the creator god, Ptah. Here are the, is the deceased and his family, and they are making the offering. He is a scribe and an artist and an artisan craftsman, and this Ptah would be his main um, deity. So here we have how her name translates. And this is why uh, the Egyptologists say, well, she is a uh, abstract concept because her, she, her name can be, her symbols, the hieroglyphic symbols that write her name can be translated into so many ways. And when you look at these, they're put as an inactive kind of down, just a description, but I suggest they aren't she is right action. And so this would be truth telling. This would be joyousness. This would be harmonizing, balancing, ordering, activating the natural laws, dispensing justice, holding right proportion, and the straightness as opposed to crookedness. And, and there are other names as well. These are the top ones. So we have to keep in mind when we see these uh, broken out like that or reference to her, she's truth, she's justice, she's law, she's, she is the action. She is the constantly flowing action. She, it is, you never get it right. You never get it frozen. It's not static, this culture was constantly on the move and they held that. And, and this is where I'll really bring in, they had not the really, one of the most exciting things when I studied this, because I had always loved Greek and, and Minoan and you know all the ancient, I thought of as ancient, but those all start like 700 BC. We're talking 3000 BC with Egypt's beginning. And what they did, we're, we get to look into a culture that's in that transition period in the Bronze Age from the Neolithic goddess, mother goddess, great goddess, womb tomb, protector, nurturing, and fiery as well as uh, beloved. And we get to see the, how the culture held it. When the Greeks came, they couldn't believe, like, why do you give your women so much rights? Like, they can sue for divorce, and they can keep their their what they bring to the relationship. They get to take with them when they go. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Women were allowed to hold positions. It was less than you. It wasn't an equal partnership because the families were absolutely so precious and the mortality rate of infants and mothers was off the charts. It was very, very high. And so, you know, there was this love of family. They held that together, but they, we get to see this more balanced where the, the split hasn't happened yet. And we get to see this in all ways. These dualities are held as self-evident. They're great observers of nature. They had medicine and they could tone a rock, a stone rock in the quarry and know that it was without fractures and that they could cart thousands of tons back to Memphis and, and 600 miles downriver and have a, a good piece of stone to work with. So th they, were, they were brilliant beyond anything that I had ever been taught when I had studied Egyptology and Egypt history and archaeology and so forth. So anyway, this is uh, something to keep in mind. I could go on for hours with this. So here's the feather of truth. It's an actual hieroglyphic symbol. 
as well as Ma'at's identifying headdress. And the only other one that really wears this with consistency is her brother, Shu. And uh, as I was working with this idea of truth or truth telling, I realized that we could employ this, uh, that I could employ this. And if I'm at a crossroad and I'm not sure what the right way to go, I could ask myself, what would Mott say? What would Mott do? And keep in mind the final measure, does this make all life flourish? So we have this beautiful idea of what, what the, the measure of truth. And again, remember that awakened heart is what holds this. What would Ma'at say? What would Ma'at do? And does this make all life flourish? And this is the way she really shaped them. That Ma'at appears in the pyramid text, their oldest text, first inscribed in stone, 2400 BC. And she goes with them all the way to the end. She is never diminished. So this is joyousness. And what we see here is a man in his tomb. He was probably a governor of a province. And he has painted in these tombs, these beautiful tombs that the artisans and scribes and, and um, higher up in the society were able to create for themselves. When you became an adult, the first thing you did was you began your tomb if you had the resources to make that happen. And the artisans undoubtedly painted their own tombs. And here he is with a beautiful white lotus to his nose. They loved the lotus. They had the white, they had the pink, I believe, and they definitely had the blue lotus. And what is that? That is the symbol of a gesture. When you hold something to your nose, it is the breath of life. It's like that first breath of the baby, the first breath when the, the creator deity, uh, the primordial mound raises and, and because he holds ma'at, order, to his nose. And the breath, the mound raises, his inertia is tended, and we see this beginning of life. So that breath of life it's actually spoken of as creating the garments of life for Shu, her brother consort. And so here's this beautiful poem that um, expresses this. And Ptah is the, the primary uh, deity in the city of Memphis. Each city kind of had its own creation myth, its own creator god. And this one is Ptah, who is the artisan and craftsman uh, chief deity they would offer to. He, he tended to all matter. And his creation myth takes a tomb's creation myth from the Heliopolis or the own uh, tradition and um, and brings it to, to Memphis. So Ptah, his consort partner, there's always a triad in each city, is Sekhmet, the lioness-headed goddess, and their son is Nefertum, the beautiful blue lotus. And I'll just read, this is from uh, about Middle Kingdom period, about 2200 BC. The water is full of vegetation. Pata is the reeds, Sekhmet, the lotus shoots. The goddess of dew is the lotus buds and Nefertum, the blossoms. It just speaks with such beauty of what's important to them and what they love, which is the awakened heart. So here we have a very important image. This is from Abydos. This is King Seti the One, New Kingdom period. And this represents to me the harmony, balance, and order. It was the king's number one responsibility to keep Ma'at. And here we see Seti One doing a ritual that would have been performed every morning, every day, in every temple throughout town. If the king wasn't in residence, then the high priest would perform the, the ritual. And as the sun is getting ready to rise, 
and the doors on the shrines of the temple are being opened for the gods to receive their first offering of the day. And the altar tables are being piled high with the fruits and vegetables and flowers and incense. Mott would be presented. And she is sitting on her hieroglyphic symbol, the little basket, which means either lady or mistress. And she has the ankh in her hand, the breath of life, also the key of life, wearing her beautiful feather. And, and he is presenting to uh, Amun-Ra or whatever god the, sh the shrine would be. Each one was given this presentation ritual. And this is a hymn, a, p a portion of a hymn to Amun-Ra in the huge temple complex of Karnak. The gods pay tribute to you with Ma'at, for they know her wisdom. Your food is Ma'at, your drink is Ma'at, your bread is Ma'at, your beer is Ma'at. You exist because Ma'at exists. Ma'at exists because you exist. She unites with your head, which is the Uraeus right there, and she manifests before you for eternity. So you read things like this, and you have to wonder, how did they ever put her at the place of an abstract concept or a minor goddess? I don't know. But <laughs> it didn't make sense to me when I started going to the original text translated and to these images. It just, uh, I, had to, I had to go with what I was seeing. So here we have a beautiful image of reciprocity. It is absolutely critical to understanding their culture and their practices and how they maintain this flow between the three realms. How do we maintain it? And it's a reciprocal flow. And if you feed in your energy and your attention and your care and your love, it flows back to you. And the ancestors were known to be in communication through dreams or, or active imagination, visions. So a, a well and wise ancestor was cherished and continued to be remembered and celebrated. So these three realms are really tied together for them through reciprocal actions. And it's not a one-way flow, it goes always. So in, in acting this, we see Seti one with an incense arm, and he is lighting the incense as the doors are open to Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra is ram-headed, we see right here. And he is like the midnight sun. And alchemy was well established by the New Kingdom period. We have images, we have text, we have irrefutable evidence. And there's a, one scholar in particular, an amazing Egyptologist who is writing on this. And I'd be happy to share resources um, at the end, you'll see my email address. And if anyone wants uh, suggestions like, you mentioned alchemy, where can I find it? Please get hold of me. So anyway, so here is Amun-Ra's beautiful shrine. Seti is making the presentation. Everything on the, it's the fruits and vegetables and the uh, unguents and wine and beer. And after the gods had had the opportunity to enjoy the energy from these offerings, the food and, and produce would be distributed to the people. So it's not a burned offering. It's not a wasted thing. There is a, a reciprocity that goes and flows, flows throughout. So here we have the natural laws. And this is where we go back to the pyramid text and we are uh, figuring out who is Tefnut and who is Ma'at? And in the pyramid text, Tefnut and Shu are named as the first sexually differentiated male and female. And they come out of the creator. The creator is like a phallus, a goddess hand, the hand goddess, a nose and a mouth. He has a cosmic orgasm. He takes the semen into his mouth, into his nose, spits out Tefnut, sneezes out Shu, and there you have the second generation. He gets more formed 
as the culture goes forward in time. But this text stays relevant throughout their history. They didn't discard it because it was sacred literature, sacred poetry. And she, so Tefnut is there, and but she's the moisture. She's the birthing mother for the second, the third generation. She's the lioness headed. She's probably very primordial and, and doesn't uh, really get sustained as she becomes Sekhmet. But she's wearing this beautiful headdress, which is the solar orb. It would normally be painted in that deep terracotta color. And it's encircled by a serpent known as the encircler, feminine, fire-breathing, hooded cobra, always shown with her hood flared. And here she is. And then I found the text that showed when Atum is floating in the noon, and he says, I'm so weary of my inertia, help. And Noon says, put your daughter, order, hold her to your nose. And when he does that, the primordial mound raises, as I told you before. So Mat is order. She's the, the beginning of the celestial pattern. She's kind of like the later, much later Sophia, the Shekinah. She's the one that lays down the order, the pattern. Creation is play for her. And as the creator God, the, the father, she's a beloved daughter, as the father watches her play with creation, he delights. There's she he brings it brings joy to him. So here we see again this beautiful duality. We have moisture and fiery, lioness headed goddess Tefnut, birthing mother, the great womb tomb, and Ma'at now coming forward as order. And, and her brother uh, Shu is, is life. So we have this beautiful family uh, dynamic happening. Okay, here we have Amun Ra. And this again is this beautiful tomb. It's compared in um, in the literature and uh, art historians all agree this is comparable to the Sistine Chapel, and uh, it truly is a, a magnificent. Uh, place to go. You have to visit it. It's a special <laughs> entrance fee. It's in the Valley of the Queens. And it, uh, what we're seeing here, these are life-size figures. You can stand beside them and they're as tall as you. And they're plaster carved, painted, and these beautiful goddesses are Nephthys. This is the fourth generation that Croatia really begins when they come. And Isis and their brothers are Osiris and Seth. There's four siblings. And we see Amun-Ra, the midnight sun. He's mama form. He's standing on one of Mott's symbols, which is the plinth. It's the foundation. And they are doing the protection, like Mott with her wings, protecting and stabilizing him. That's the role of the divine feminine. Nephthys is the night journey. Isis is the day journey. They are already harmonized. The men have to, the masculine has to contend with one another. The feminine comes in harmonizing and protecting. And they go out of balance, but they go out of balance all by themselves. So here we have Thoth, who becomes Hermes Trismegistus. He's the god of wisdom. He's a lunar god. He predates the historical period. So he goes way back. And he is a vizier. He's the he's the the wisdom teacher, the wisdom holder, and we see him here inscribing the palm frond scepter that says million of years, and he's inscribing the length of the king's reign. So that was his to do. He's also the consort of Maat. And then we have Pata, and I said enough about him already. I think he's within his shrine. Uh, and he's also, this is from Nefertari's tomb as well. These are just these gorgeous images. We're so lucky that there some of it stills remains. Their plaster is falling off the walls. Go see it quick. So those are also the, the creator gods that are known as the lords of Ma'at. And here we see a human 
who is a magistrate who's also a lord of Mott. And what all of these beings that are lords of Mott, they talk about it as having mastery of uh, Mott. And, and people often translate that as power over. But in fact, the mastery is he has mastered Ma'at and himself as the beautiful poem, uh, hymn from uh, Karnak to Amun-Ra told us, you are Ma'at and Ma'at is you. This is this combination, this, this complementary duality that was at the heart of their culture. I can't stress that enough. It's so important to understand that. And this, what that means for him is that he has mastered the awakened heart and the wisdom of Mott. He has mastered it within himself, and thus he is above reproach. He is above corruption. He is above being influenced or showing preference for one or the other. His duty is the dispensing of social justice and keeping the fabric of the society in order. And there's a marvelous text I want to recommend. It's very accessible, very readable. There's a small uh, translation of it you can find, and it's called The Eloquent Peasant. And in it, this story, it is so beautiful how Ma'at is explained within the elements of nature, within the ecosystem, within the human interaction with human, with nature, with the river, with the with the celestial beings. And it really is gorgeous. I know you all probably are familiar with the wor world weary man in conversation with his ba from the same time period, Middle Kingdom period, we're talking 2200 BC. And they, they had a huge, the Middle Kingdom was this explosion of this literary uh capability and um and we have so much of it accessible which is really quite astounding it's a fraction of what they did so here is this beautiful as i was <clears throat> preparing for this presentation and i was having a little car ride between boulder down to santa fe i heard this three-hour podcast i can't recommend it enough it is I, just so you know I have a nickname in my family. I'm known as the Cosmic Librarian. <laughs> so this is not the end of my suggestions for books and reading and so forth. I love research. So this is, it was called Oh Justice. It's the Emerald Podcast on Patreon.com. And this man's three-hour presentation on justice, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> and he publishes in on March 3rd. I heard it about that time, and I'm going to read it. If I can move my little people here up to the top. In times of global upheaval, ecological destruction, and societal inequity, justice can seem very far away. Justice in the modern world is often viewed as a contract an agreement forged between human beings rather than something inherent to the natural world. And yet, for many cultural traditions, just cultures and traditions, justice is seen as a living presence, as the actual dynamic flow of cause and effect that serves to keep the larger natural balance. And this, it, he couldn't have described Mott more thoroughly in that idea of her being part of the, the natural laws and the living presence. It's not a dead idea, and it isn't just anthropocentric. It is the natural world has rights, the bees, the rivers, the oceans, the mountains, the trees, the forest, and we need to start taking those things into account. So here is this beautiful image of Ma'at as the opener of the ways. She is the psychopomp. You see, this is the bark. All of their transportation happened on the river. It was the perfect vehicle. The flow goes from south to north, and the winds blow from north to south. So they had a really lovely 
uh, gift to them with that beautiful Nile River. And Mott is standing here on the bow of the boat. She is in a, in a position of intense concentration. Her arm is out, her hand palm down, is sensing the waters in front of her because there are unseen dangers from sandbars to Apophis, the dread arch enemy of Ra. And what we're seeing is the boat of renewal. And this was seen as happening every single 24-hour period where the journey of the sun would take place across the sky, solar boat, day boat was Isis. And she would carry her companions, including the high god Ra, and she would carry them to sunset. And then the journey continued with the night boat and the companions and the sun god would willingly sacrifice his uh, life, his life force, and his companions would accompany him and the night bark down into the underworld. Renewal happened at that darkest, deepest point, the nadir, the sixth hour, when Osiris, the corpse, the king of the underworld, the lord of the underworld, is joined by the solar god, and they become one. And there's always this, and they said, Ra's journey is to death. Osiris's journey is to life. So they reversed what we know about the journey and the night sea journey. They reversed it. So when this mystical, it happened in the other, utter darkness, in the lowest point of the underworld happened, you would get uh, the joining of the two solar beings that would be able to take the journey up. We see here the beautiful divine child. This is the renewed energy. He's sitting inside his womb. He isn't birthed yet. He has the Uraeus serpent guiding and protecting him. He's cradled in the hieroglyphic symbol for the um, horizon. The beautiful Uraeus is here, the hooded cobra. She's present. She's the steady oarsman. And we have Thoth as in his baboon form, offering praise. And they are protecting, they are divining that the path is clear, and they are bringing the boat to the dawn. Here we see the inverted falcon head. So we are in the underworld. We're in that darkest hour. And beaming from his head is the starlight to renew and revive the dead. And the really interesting thing by this period, they had in all their text, everyone upon death becomes Osiris. And so you, every night, are given the opportunity to renew and revive. And um, this is one of uh, dear Erica's favorite beings, the neck bat, the vulturess. She's part of the two ladies from the very earliest when they realized that to create their future going forward in 3100 BC, they needed to bring together the two halves of their country. They're very well uh, defined geographically between mountains. There's a cataract at, in the far southern edge of the, the traditional border and the Mediterranean at the other end. And they had two halves and they were warring constantly, constantly battling. And they finally came together under one leader and created a nation state. It took about 400 years of battling in the historic period and they did it. And these became their symbols. Nekbet, the mother vulture, and Wajet, the cobra mother goddess. And that is all we are going to say about that. So here is, he's a German Jungian, and he wrote a book about the journey into the um, into the netherworld, and it's his quote is, as the embodiment of cosmic order, the goddess Ma'at is also the guarantor of social justice. That is, the wisdom of the ordered creation that exists in the imminent world and that extends into the netherworld. And I would add, and extends into the divine world. 
So this, before we leave, we have to visit the netherworld. I can't do it justice because it's a huge topic in and of itself. But this is the Hall of Double Ma'at. And this, we see the scale that weighs the heart. This is the scene is called the weighing of the heart. And there uh, isn't a human that dies that doesn't experience this, regardless of rank or privilege or wealth or poorness or doesn't, there's no, there's, everyone comes here. This is the moment of truth and your heart, this is the deceased here, his heart is on one side and Ma'at or her feather is on the other. Here we see the uh, double Ma'at. She's in a white dress and a dark dress. She's got two. They both are holding a serpent staff, also with mop feathers. We've got the mop feathers up here as well. And the plinth is foundation. She's standing on the green plinth of foundation. And he, the deceased, has his arms in a gesture that was praise, that was devotion. And sitting here, uh, attending to the plumbob and making sure everything's working is the god Dahuti or Thoth and in his baboon form. And there's even a little mot feather on top. So here we have one of the most common symbols throughout all kinds of cultures, the cross. We've got the vertical, we've got the horizontal, and when those are measured in this way, we know he's true of voice. He has been found to have a, a heart that is as light or as heavy as Ma'at. And it's not too light, it's not too heavy. And what is so interesting when I hear this scholarship in this area, we always talk about the assessors or the judges of uh, of this scene, or we talk about Osiris as the judge, as if it's an external judgment. It is not. The heart is what does the testifying and the judging. And the heart, the assessors are there to hear the confessions of innocence, and Osiris is there at the end, should you pass, to welcome you. So this is really the heart is said, the scarab that was created to protect the heart when the body was mummified. It was the only organ left in the body because it's important. You're going to need it. And here's where you need it. And the scarab has a poem on the back that says, Oh, my mother, my heart. Oh, my mother of my heart. Protect me. Do not testify against me. And what this is telling us is that the heart was created from one drop of blood at the moment of your conception. And that should you be found unworthy, it's because your heart said, he didn't listen. She had no interest in hearing what we were trying to communicate as the good life. And so this heart and you also have the lenience and love of the mother. So you have this beautiful image of, of this uh, occurrence where you know this is what's going to come. And the eloquent peasant tells you what you need to know about what they expected uh, for you to know of your saying and your doing, because that's what you needed to have here. You needed to be able to say more often than not, I didn't do it perfect, I'm human. And they said, yep, we agree. Uh, but I did saying and doing of ma more often than not. So you're a resource. So we're making a transition here. We're going now into the most recent uh, avenue of my research that I am so excited about because it takes all this beautiful scholarship of that I've poured my heart into and it turns it into something that we can apply in our own lives right now and to face these things. And I love the description of the May presentation of taking the images of apocalypse and really working with them. And that's kind of the same idea here. This is Nathan Schwartz Salent. He's written a number of books 
Uh, this order disorder paradox is unbelievable. You will all love it. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He uh, is a Jungian. He just recently died and he started life as a physicist. And so he brings in science. He brings in uh, his understanding of how all of this works. His writing can some type be <laughs> very dense. I have to read it slow like five times, but it is so beautiful and it really applies to this. Our collective attitude, our zeitgeist, is dominated by the belief that disorder is an enemy, for it impedes our continual progress and our ability to construct new solutions. Mental confusion, insecurities about solving our problems in relationship, creativity in the workplace, and a frightening sense of feeling weakened are all seen as worthless states requiring a remedy through the will that overactive, overused, heroic part of our beings that aren't getting the that isn't getting the job done. So it, I want to say that again. So it, they're all seen as worthless states requiring a remedy through will. And um, boy, I myself have found that that is about the last thing that I need when I'm in a disordered state is will. So I, I decided after reading that, I was like, okay, well, what is opposite of Mont? What is the what is the true balance? If she's over here and we know that she's truth and all these things, what's the opposite? And it's is fit. It's not even a personification. It's translated as the word chaos. And here's a list of all the things that cause is fit, that cause chaos. Number one, inertia, greediness, falsehood, crookedness, violence, antisocial behavior, disorder, injustice, deceitfulness, causing harm, argumentative, unreasonableness. So I asked myself, well, who are the beings that embody this and how do they envision working with that? So number one, Apophis this great arch enemy of Ra. He's seen as a big white snake. He is in the water. He's the one that tries to impede that renewal process. It's just the nascent little joining together of Ra and, and Osiris it coming. It's going to be the renewal. It's going to be the divine child. And he shows up and he drinks up all the water He's like a sandbar. He strands the solar bark. He stalls out in a, um, the renewal. He's, a, he's an agent of the all and nothing waters of the nun. And he is just trying to pull us down into an undifferentiated fog. And I'll tell you, this is one I've had to work the hardest with because He's that plaintive voice that I heard when I um, asked myself, what could I do after hearing Drew's beautiful poem? I, so I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a, a eco-psychologist. I'm not even a, a politician. Like, what can I do? I'm a mother. I'm an artist. I'm a, a mythologist. How can I attend to this? And it kind of put me to sleep for a while. Next, Seth. Seth is the brother of Osiris, Isis, and Nephthys, and he is the storm god. And despite being one of that fourth generation, he is always seen as the, the foreigner, the outsider. He's of the deserts. He's of the red sands. He's hot-bellied instincts. I love that. They use that phrase, actually. It's become my new favorite phrase for that, the hot-bellied instincts and that express themselves with divisiveness and greedy and self-serving, power-hungry and murderous rage, and then the wrathful feminine. And she's my favorite because she reminds me of the Dakinis from Tibetan Buddhism, and she's the Durga and Kali and in Hinduism. She is that stand back. If you get on the wrong side of her, there's nothing that can help you. 
And she's the lioness headed goddesses. She's the eye. She's the Uraeus. So she also has that, you know, side that you want. She has the nurturing, as do they all. So let's see how that shows up. So Apophis. First thing is it's hard to find the images of the beings when they're out of balance. All words, all images, all the hieroglyphic text and images are considered holy and living. And so the cat here is Isis. And you do not show dangerous creatures unless you have dismembered them or you have take, dealt with their dangerous uh uh, uh, characteristics and attributes. And the cat here as Isis is killing the snake. So let's look at that just for a moment. This beautiful cat image. She's feminine. She's a feline. She has those whiskers. She's great of magic. She's a wild cat with her spots in her ears and striped tail. She's got this huge flint blade that she's dis beheading the the serpent Apophis, and she's stopping him in his trap. She's a hunter. She's spotted him. She's like, I see you, Apophis. Poof, I'm here to stop your influence. Your influence needs to be contained. We're not putting the bark in danger. We're not stranding it in the undifferentiated water. And then we have here carved into the uh, stone wall, the symbol for Nun, for Nu, and Apophis moving to the left into regression, into the trying to get back into the unconscious pin with five flint blades. So they've stopped this that by spotting it. You have to see it. When something comes up from that underworld realm, you have to be able to spot it when it comes out of the unconscious and, and see it in yourself. So when it's a pacified, what happens? This is beautiful. This image is of the dawn. This is just the moment before the sun crests above the horizon. We have Apophis and his posse of three snakes that accompany him, and he has been pacified. He's been pinned, he's been spotted, and now he becomes the moisture, that deep, instinctual, intuitive moisture that helps to float the bark. And in the bark, we have Ra as the forefront on the bow. You can think of this as consciousness. They had a very psychological uh, perspective on, on their imagery and on life. And you then have Hathor and Mott as the two figures. And then you have the, the scarab beetle winged, wings flared, just ready to take off into the sky. And his name is Kepri. Kepri means, translates into constantly becoming. He's constantly on the move, constantly becoming. It's what they really treasured. Don't get stagnant. Don't get inert. Don't get clamped down. And then we have the falcon-headed uh, anthropomorphic male, and he's at the tiller. I would guess that's probably Horus if we had some hieroglyphic symbols to tell us his name. But this is pacified. This is his beautiful Apophis now becomes an agent of helping us in the renewal process. So once we get those instinctual energies back into an alignment, we make them conscious, we see, we harmonize, we've got help. And here is a beautiful dawn. This is from our trip that Erica and I were on. We were on the Nile for 11 days and nights. And this is the moment before dawn. This is the hour of Kepri. He's ready to um, emerge from the horizon, from the underworld. And it's also the first hour of the day, which is named for Mott. And in this situation, she is called she who beholds the beauty of her Lord. You can see what a beautiful Nile and the sky, ah, gorgeous. So here is Seth. And as I said, Seth killed his brother. He warred for 80 years or more with Horus. Horus came and tried to claim his, his rightful right to sit on his father's throne. And Seth said, no way. And all the gods council said, nope, it should go to Horus, he's the son, except for Ra. 
And Ross said, nope, it stays with Seth. Seth is strong. Seth can defend us. Seth is the one we need. This is an untried youth. We don't want him. And so they began battling. And the, the every response that to, as Horace gets more and more Sethian as he goes, every response to them say, well, now wait, he did. No, nope, battle again. Let's keep going. And he just keeps wanting to use the same force and powers and instinctual energies to, to defeat Horace or murder him, but he can't. And so after 80 years, the gods are at their wits end. They don't know what to do. And finally, Isis is like, oh, for God's sakes. She is great of magic. She's been excluded from the council because she's so outspoken. And she assumes the disguise of a beautiful, irresistible young woman. And she walks by where the council is meeting. And Seth sees her and is like, oh, I've got to get her. <laughs> and he runs out to try and seduce her. And she's a, a playing coy. And she said, well, I would be very appreciative of anyone who could help me. My son is young still, and I'm a young widow. And this man has moved into my barn. And he says that if I try to get, claim my son's right to inherit his father's farm, he will kill his my son and take the, everything for himself. What should I do? I would be so appreciative of your wisdom and your help. And Seth's like, well, that's outrageous. That's absolutely inappropriate. Everyone knows that the patrimony should go to the son. The father's estate <clears throat> should go to the son. I'll take care of that scoundrel. And with that, Isis drops her disguise, flies to the top of the tree in her bird form as a, a small kite, a falcon, and starts squawking, by your own words, by your own words, you've confessed. You know what's right. Do what is right. Seth is outraged. He goes running to Ra's pavilion. He bursts in and says, get Isis out of here. What is she doing here? And Ra says, tell me what's happened. And as he's telling the story, Seth burst into tears. And Ra goes, fine. You see, your own heart sees what is the right action. Call the council. And Ra declares, I am now in favor. Horus has earned the right to his father's throne, and Seth has conceded his, his uh, place on the throne. And Isis says, well, he should get what he gave my beloved Osiris. And Ra says, no, I need him on the bow of my boat. So when Seth is pacified, when the instinctual energies can be brought together, we can see that they belong on the bow of the boat, the instinct, the intuition, his strength, his hunter capacities all belong on the bow of the boat to defend from this arch rival of Ra that would impede. So we bring our connection and our instinctual energies, we bring them up into consciousness, we harmonize them, and we get right action going forward. So quick story about the wrathful feminine, and then we'll go to the Q&A section. But the wrathful feminine is in this case based on a story called The Distant Goddess. It goes like this. Ra and his beloved daughter have an argument, and she storms off in a rage, and she leaves Egypt far into the south, into Nubia, and she takes the form of the lioness, and she lives in the lair, and she says, if anyone comes near me, they're dead. And she lives that way for a long time. And Ra finally calls his emissaries, calls his, his counsel, and says, we have to get her back 
She's moisture. She's protection. She's my beloved daughter. She's beauty. We need her energy. We need her to come home. She's isolating. We need her back. And the emissaries go. They're unsuccessful. Some of them come back. Some of them we never see again until Thoth. And Ra says, Thoth, you're the last hope. you got to get her back. Off he goes. And just before he gets to, to her lair, he assumes the form of the baboon. And he comes and he sits humbly in the sand, just far enough away to be out of claw reach, and says to her, daughter of Ra, beloved daughter, your father misses you. He needs you to come home. Please return with me and, and be by his side. Offer him your moisture and your protection and your beauty. We all need it. And she's in Infuriated, she roars, a huge, vicious roar. And she says, never, don't talk to me about returning, never. He goes, goes silent, he looks down, he waits until she cools off. And then he said, daughter of Ra, you have an obligation, you have duty. Your duty is to Egypt, is to your people. You need to come back with me. And she's like, what? Duty? You speak to me of duty. I have no duty to anyone but me. And okay, okay. And so then he pauses a little bit longer this time. And he gathers his thought and he says, Beloved daughter of Ra, accompany back me back to Egypt. And I promise you, as we re-enter Egypt at each and every temple, there will be celebration, there will be feasting, there will be music and dancing to re celebrate your return. They will sing your praises. We all miss you. We all need you. Well, she thinks, and then she looks at him sideways and says, feasting? Yes, Feasting like you cannot believe, piles of the best fruit and lots and lots of wine and beer, everything you love, flowers, incense, dancing and music, oh, dancing and music and singing your praise that will go on for days. And so she agrees to go. And it is, as he said, at each temple, as they re-enter Egypt, there they are feasting and celebrating her, and soon she is beautiful of face. She is pacified. And what does this story so beautifully illustrate for us but Eros? And that place that's missing in our culture of the rituals and the ceremony and the celebration of the bounty of life in relationship to the divine, in relationship to the ancestral, we have to reclaim celebrating that eros, that connection, that energy that brings us together, or we get stuck in the eros that is anemone, and it's stuck and frozen in that hard place like we're seeing is such a problem in our world today. So again, from the Emerald Podcast, O oh Justice, tradition after tradition speaks of the larger law of the cosmos and of the human role in aligning to it. At a time when people are experiencing deep grief and anxiety over the fate of the planet, understanding and reconnecting to a living vision of justice, and remember, this is justice, the bigger justice, the imminent justice, can help provide not only a sense of a somatic anchor, but a way forward that asks us to align to something both immediate and ultimate. So body, the immediate, the ultimate, weaving this together, this is such a beautiful articulation of what I'm talking to you about. And so our last few images are going to be of the symbol that they created at the very beginning of their unification that stayed with them till the end of time. It's carved into the uh, thrones and the statues of the great kings who built the pyramids even. And here we have the trachea, 
the lungs, perfectly balanced and mirrored Seth, Horus, and these are their animal heads, and they're holding the flowers of the papyrus and the lotus, upper and lower Egypt. Their feet are resting on the lungs, and this is the breath of life, the key of life. This is absolutely critical. You bring together the opposites, you harmonize them, and the life is returned. This is another way to look at it. This is life-size figures in the Cairo Museum. Horus, Seth, identical, mirrored. And between them, they've created that third structure that is the breaking down of the old stuck energy and the beginning to recreate what uh, comes forth as the renewed renewal, the the new culture, the new identity, the new personality structure. And what we know is that the left leg forward, which all three of these figures has, is movement from the awakened heart. So that's what that is. And he, their hands are up to his crown, to his, the head, the uh, where he's emanating. And they had an understanding of the sheaths just like in India of the energy bodies. That's why there were multiple coffins around their mummies. And this is really, we're seeing an echo of that in this image. And this is again from Nathan. He says, disorder related to an internal creative process can be purposeful. So this order, disorder paradox is purposeful. It has a point it's driving us to. It acts to dissolve the primitive structures that impede the change, the personality change in this case, the or, or it could be a societal change. It helps us to dissolve. So we embrace that order and disorder. We don't try to get rid of one and preference the other. We want them together and we want to see how they can be to acting together. And then the disintegration process, whose symptoms are horribly uncomfortable, guilt, anxiety, fear, shame, is what seeks to create the third structure. It's a creative process. All of you who work with art or in your therapy practices, this is the key, is how do we grow the capacity? How do we strengthen the being? So this is there, uh, Nathan, and then the images hopefully give you a mythological lens and some uh, ways of working with it. His chapter five, I highly recommend. It shows working with creation myths from about five or six different cultures with clients and how that can be of use. And so this third structure, what is it? It's the transcendent function that Jung identified. It's an ongoing connection between the conscious and the unconscious and this bridge must be brought into being. It doesn't just come about by magic. And the order-disorder paradox is a major factor in forming this invaluable aspect of our psychic life. And here we see the last images of Abu Simbel. And this is Ramses the Great, the husband of Nefertari. And here is Seth. And you see he's facing Seth. Seth, he is a warrior. His uh, lineage came from the military class, not the aristocracy. And Seth, uh, his father said he won, was a man of Seth, beloved of Ptah. So they saw the harmony of mastering with the awakened heart, the instinctual side that allows you to be successful in a battle situation and strategy with the Horus that brings in the higher consciousness, but you don't want the hyper of either. It dries you out. So this is that image. And it's such a beautiful illustration for the third structure. And we're going to end here with a beautiful quote from Jung and the beautiful blue lotuses that had nearly gone extinct. And um, they're being brought back by a woman in Egypt, right below Cairo. And in all chaos, there is a cosmos. In all disorder, a secret order. This is another way of saying what Nathan's saying. So let me read it again. In all chaos, there is a cosmos. 
in all disorder, a secret order. And we end with this beautiful image of the entwined hands. For me, it's a further representation of that sima, that unity, that uniting image. And I'm going to stop sharing here and come back to all of you. Hi. <laughs> I hope uh, that journey, it was a lot. It's a lot to swallow and it's pretty complicated. It's a, it's a dense, beautiful, multi-layered culture and it just is filled with so much. And I, as I said in my invocation, that it touches me that they carved, they had prophecies and they knew that their time was coming to an end. And so as it came closer and closer to that disintegration that they envisioned happening, they put more and more of their mysteries into the stone, into that which they knew was in, would last for millions, is what they had hoped, in their temples in Dindara. And you can go and see it and interact with these huge stone edifices and then all these papyruses and and imagery that just survives for us to encounter. And they had a prophecy. They said, we are ending our times. Cities will become mounds and disappear. And they said, there, were, uh, th there are ones who will come after us in the future. We don't know when. And they will be able to find our remnants and make use of them. So they did it for us. And I, I can feel it. I hope you can too. Okay. I'm ready for questions. Go ahead, Elric. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, Laurie, thank you. Just what a beautiful, beautiful um, presentation. You are indeed the cosmic librarian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just wanna make a quick sort of um, general observation about my impression of the, your presentation of Egyptian religion and the religious attitude that it is a, it seems a religion of integration rather than what we see in other, I would say, younger forms of religion where it is duo, duo thinking, dualistic thinking, mm -hmm. where, where good and evil are at war and, and that the ultimate at the end of the story is that good prevails over evil and the evil is destroyed. But in your presentation of this Egyptian religion, we see that um, Seth and Horus, uh, if you were to divide them up and say one is the good son and one is the, the greedy son, um, the, they're, they're not, just, neither of them wins or is destroyed. There's an integration going on. There's a, there's a breathing going on between them. And that is a much deeper and much more useful um, tool for uh, consciousness and for the psyche than than the idea, the younger idea that you just have to be good or, or bad. And I think we're moving towards that. You know, when, when quantum physics started to get its legs under it, it, it's really, that's the view that they had, which is if you take one of these away, if you overcome one of these, what do you have? You it both go. Yes. Yeah. They so, arise mutually. Yeah, they arise mutually. The trick is not that. They had a wonderful saying. It started in the fifth dynasty. So way back old kingdom pyramid time. And they realized as that, per that period, that age came to a close, it was about four or 500 years long. It started to deteriorate and they realized we got to do something about this. And they created something called the wisdom literature or the wisdom teachings, the wisdom instructions. And they had a saying, no one is born wise. If you are causing disharmony, if you're causing disruption, then you are uneducated and you require education. And those texts continue to be added to over the centuries 
and and in fact influenced the proverbs. It's almost when you tr compare translations, scholars have done this. It's almost word for word. In fact, like it was just lifted. We had the Christian mothers and fathers. We had the Palestine. We had all that there influencing, but we didn't get the piece that keeps the whole together. So thank you for pointing that out. Really great comment and it's, observation. It's beautiful. I'll just leave with this. Um, the idea of the opposites, if we were to look at them differently and call them tandems mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than opposites, they uphold each other. They do. It's the it's the complementary duality. Thank you so much for your comments. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Larson. Really, really powerful um, presentation. I loved your mix of storytelling and poetry and analysis and reflection. So, just first off, thank you. Um, yeah. So, my question is just in terms of of Mott, there's so many potent messages and um, potent messages and, and stories within just the many faces that she seems to wear. But what kind of like, as you've gone through this and reflecting on kind of your initial story, like what has stood out to you in terms of the message that we can take into our hearts in the, the present day in the face of everything that's going on with the beautiful poem that you read and the memory that you shared? What's, what's the message that we could could carry forward from this presentation, just as we go out to face the the complexity and and um, scariness of the world that we live in today. That's my question. I, really, I love that question. Thank you. And I really, um, I, it's the what touches me is the awakened heart. It's looking at their images and seeing the practices. How did they create that reciprocal relationship and knowing that? And then the thing that I love the most, I didn't stress it very much because it takes us down an avenue, but it's the companions in the bark. And the sense I get as I work with this material, as I try to bring it in and say, how could this help us? There is such a strong, if the, if the masculine solar consciousness, highest consciousness there is, has to willingly sacrifice and turn over their well-being to the companions that he has selected for that night journey into the dangerous realms to be successful in renewal. It's the companions, and they're masculine and they're feminine, and they work hard together. They see it as an honor within their afterlife traditions to be worthy of living a life that you would be seen as a companion. And I think that's something that we're really missing. Like when we think about, when I think about how overwhelming the task is in front of us of renewal and redoing the systems that are crumbling and all the things that are are coming about i really look at the the companions choose well they're your they're your allies and they are on multiple levels they're in this world and the terrestrial world and they're beyond they're in the ancestral and they're in the divine and it's just activating that reciprocal relationship so that you can access it. And this was really written for you and your generation and the generations that will come after you. That's who thank my you. audience was. It was the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the good question. Go ahead, Erica. There it is. Put it over a little this way. There you go. Perfect. Yep. It's so good. And it's just a tiny little book. You you need to unmute yourself. Did you have something you want to say? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and I love the alchemical image with the sun, the, the city, and the dying, and then the greens at the very bottom, the green sprouts coming up. That it is beautiful. beautiful. It's yeah. such a good book. It should be on everyone's shelf because... It's really wonderful. It's just tiny, but it's so dense. It is. And, I'm, and chapter five. <laughs> and listening to you, I feel like I'm back in Egypt, mm. you know, at the button, some pyramid or some 
um, Abydos or whatever, looking at these gorgeous um, carvings and you saying, well, look at the dress and look at what the goddess is doing to the god and look at the, the relationships. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your invitation to be part of this. I really enjoyed it. Good. Thanks. Go ahead, Rosemary. Hi, this is Rosemary's daughter, Eve. And hi. I, hi, thank you so much. I have like a series of little quick questions. Um, I, I have a friend, um, Solange Ashby. I don't know if you know her, but she's like you. She's completely dedicated to this study. And she found many of the hieroglyphics. She didn't agree with the, uh, the original patriarchal way of interpreting them. And I, I noticed, I love the way that you are breathing into this with us. And and sometimes I see, or I, I wonder if a way to talk about this time in our history is that this is the time where we, it's the ushering in of the feminine, of returning to the feminine that embraces the masculine, but that with the feminine at the heart, the heart of it all for, for him, to give him purpose, to give him healing. Um, so I just had a little questions. One is Solange Ashby. I hope that you'll connect with her. She's in Egypt right now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. And maybe through me or my mom or some way we can get you connected with her on Facebook. She's posting yeah, everything. I think my um my email address is in the chat, right, Andrew? Yes. Andrew put my email address in the chat. So please get that. And if you have questions or you want to connect me to somebody, I would love that. I would love it. Okay, yeah. You in see. the bark. Let's build the companions in the bark. Yes, you too. And, and she's her connection is, uh, one of the things she talks a lot about is that Nub the Nubians are this really feminine-centered culture, and all of the gold and the beautiful artifacts were actually made by the Nubians Um and what does that mean, you know? So right. it's so, so fascinating. But I wondered, is Ma'at, um, what is that connection between her and Isis? Like, are they actually one and the same on a certain level? Or are they really different energies? They're really different energies. They were seen as both imminent and transcendent. The, all the gods and goddesses, they're seen more as principles. So they're in nature, they're, and so they they interact, but Ma'at really holds that place of all those, the truth and the cosmos. She's a primordial uh, goddess from the beginning, and Isis is more akin, uh, she changes headdresses and so forth with uh, Hathor, and, and she kind of absorbed as we went later and later into the history historical period, uh, Isis absorbed other goddesses' purviews. And, but Ma stayed herself because she was the number one, her relationship to kingship was the number one. It's just like the, the chalice mysteries. If the king isn't doing his duty by Ma, if he isn't supporting and upholding Ma, the land turns into a wasteland. And so, and so Isis, more, she's the queen, she's the solar, she's the feminine um, energy that is the equivalent. She even, you know, outsmarts, she's great of magic. She outsmarts Ra and gets his secret name so that her, she has the most power over, uh, you know, whenever you learn the secret name of something, uh, it's true in uh, any magical practice, you learn the secret name and you become uh, able to command or work with that energy. And so she is really, she's that. And and she is her her opposite side, though, that I like in the funerary text is, and I'd love to come back and do that as a whole workshop for you guys. We'd need a day or two. But it's the the night bark and the day bark. And Nephthys is the hidden one. She stays in the dark and does the funerary practices. And Isis is the queen. Oh, so, okay. So can you say a little bit about the wings and the snake? Because like, like my friend Solange, she's so... Uh, the snake so alive she she found in her studies she won't even like wear snake earrings or have any snake anything because it is something about the image being complete like shakti or something and 
So the, the as I said, she's in that serpent is in. She's associated with the eye. She's the most powerful. She's the higher, higher consciousness. She comes out of the third eye. They actually saw it as penetrating the forehead when the king is crowned. He becomes semi-divine and when he's crowned. And the first crown is the uraeus. It's the hooded cobra. And she seats herself in his penal gland to activate his higher consciousness, to open up the chakra, the seventh chakra to the uh, cosmos. They they don't call it chakras and things, but they we know they worked with these energies in this way. They were great practitioners of the magic, which is actually Heka. Couldn't be a high official without that training. And so the snake is this cosmic, active, powerful, protective, energy. She's also fire breathing. She's uh, seen as this force. And she and when she is planted in the, the third eye, she becomes the most powerful. All the other energies bow to her knowing she because she is connected to that higher source. Oh. So she is totally active. She's totally um, energized. She is that Shakti principle. And um, and then what was the, the wings are the wings of protection. So the only goddesses that I've seen with wings are Newt, who is the sky goddess. She's, uh, you know, shown with the blue wings in that one image. But you see Mott, Isis, and Nephthys. And the wings are protective. And they're also used to fan life back into Osiris. After he's been dismembered, the Isis and Nephthys have found all his parts. They've remembered him. They're doing the ceremony to reactivate his body so that he can produce an heir to with Isis in the underworld after dismemberment. And they fan him oh. to reawaken him. And, and the wings are the protective. So they're very... Uh, beautiful, potent symbol. They're never used as a weapon that I've seen, but, but the, the feminine are that power to restore the great mother. This is the Neolithic. I'm sure of it. Oh. I, my next trip is to get to Turkey and to Crete so that I can see the older traditions uh, coming out of Turkey that really enshrined the mountain mother, the great Neolithic mother that goes back before the Bronze Age. It it really touches me, the idea of the dismembered masculine right now all over the planet. Just He's not whole. He's just destroying the world and he's broken into bits. And how do we as the feminine or men in their feminine breathe life back into, put, remember, put put the mass, sacred masculine back together somehow? You know, it's beautiful. They have a lament that um, was performed in a huge, the biggest ceremony every year. It was in Abydos at the temple uh, where the, to Osiris, it was his major cult center. And the, the the lament that went back and forth between Isis and Nephthys, her sister, was awake, awake, for you have not died. Roll from your left side to your right side. Breathe in the cool, moist air of the Nile. Awake. Oh. You don't know where you are, but I do. And then next oh. the wow. So you, the psychopomp, like you don't know where you are, but you're not alone. We do. We're here to help you breathe, roll from death to wake, awaken. Awaken. And then when you think all of us are Osiris upon our death, all of us become Osiris. And that is the instruction to us. Awake, awake, for you have not died. Roll from your left side to your right side. Breathe in the cool, moist air. You don't know where you are, but I do. And I'm here. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Is uh, Osiris the one that is dismembered and is put back together? Yes, and by his brother Seth, 
And at first he's just trapped. The, actually, I have to make this point because uh, Nephthys has told me I got to make this point. Uh, th actually, the myth that we have of Osiris and Isis, it's told by mythologists right and left. It's written in Egyptology books. We can get a dictionary. There it is. And it's called the myth of Isis and Osiris. And it's from Plutarch, who was writing in 300 maybe even A.D., I think, for a Greek audience. And so he takes the story, which the Egyptians had very short little myths. They didn't do great big long myths. They had snippets in their sacred text. And he takes the story and he weaves a tale for his Greek audience. And then we are given this as if this is the story of Isis and Osiris. And it's a wonderful story, but when I found out what the real story was, I was like, it pales in comparison. We need to reclaim the Plutarch even goes so far as to name Nephthys the housewife. He doesn't quite know what to do with her, so he assigns her housewife duties and tells us all that he's that she's taking care of Horus and helping raise children and that she's, you know, got to have sex with Osiris once and she tricked him. So it, it's just, it's a horrible denigration of this goddess. That's the whole half of the journey that is this, that is there, that is absolutely critical to this, this bringing uh, together these two halves. And so. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you just say it out loud? Will you just say it in case we can't find it on the thread? Because we're not such good computer people over here. Yes, it's my name, Lori Larson, all uh, L A U R I E L A R S E N at M E me dot com. And there is, Andrew has just pulled it up so we can see it at the bottom of the screen. Oh, Lori at me.com. In me.com. And I will be happy to answer questions or point you to resources. I found some incredible uh, Egyptologists, women who are doing amazing work with alchemy and recognizing and bringing forth this uh, portion of of uh, of the mythology that has really been covered over, you know the, that we've been so focused on the king and the masculine and finding monotheism, and we've wanted to have all these things that reflect us, mm -hmm. whereas the real jewel is having them teach us about what they know and understood. Oh. And that scholarship wow. upside down and I go I cheer for everyone who does that <laughs> thank you thank you thank you for your questions and comments Martin go ahead all right can everyone hear me yes okay yep. wonderful um thank you Lori first off for such a insightful and vibrant presentation I feel like the more I hear you talk, the less questions I have and the more because you're kind of speaking to it as as we go along. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak maybe briefly, this is kind of building off of everything that's already been asked, but like your portrait of the of the mythology, the sort of pantheon and the the sort of inner outer spiritual cosmology of ancient Egypt, it seems so alive in you and it seems so, um, you're describing it in a way that is so imminent and like, inf like infused in nature and experience. Like you're saying, less, less, um, less of this sort of top down, we have this idea of ancient Egypt that it's this just like oppressive solar cult and you're really painting this it, this much more complex tapestry like can you speak to how the average Egyptian had these forces alive in their bodies in their psyche in their day-to-day -day? how does that live through you as someone that cares so much about this yeah that was one of the things so where I started with this was that question after that poem after the experience of seeing the forest in such a disarray 
I, I had a question, you know, how did they do this renewal? How did they do? That was my thesis question for my dissertation. So in digging through all the history and cultural remnants, I was able to put together this vision that this Ma'at figure was at the heart of their culture. And so then I was like, well, okay, so how did they work with her? And if you think about what ancient Egypt was, they had the, the, the heart, the awakened heart, is based in direct apprehension. So you, the way that they worked with it, they don't have a codified dogma that they're teaching people to learn. They don't have even the rules of the Ten Commandments. What they've got are rituals. And the ritual calendar that we have that was carved into some of the temple walls there at the end was so rich. It was it was there was a maybe 15 days in a total 365 day year where they where there weren't rituals happening and the barks the images of these gods and goddesses would come out of the temples temples were the houses of the gods so they didn't people didn't come in unless they were purified and prepared for the power of that interaction. and But the barks, the images would come out, they would be processed, there would be food, there would be celebration. And there's some um, beautiful stories of people envisioning what it was like. The Greeks came to Egypt and they witnessed this for themselves. In 400 BC, we know Plato was there for 14 years. We know uh, that Plutarch, we know Herodotus, uh, Heraclitus, we know that P Pythagoras, all these people came. This was the most sophisticated, intact culture in the Mediterranean basin. Can you imagine coming in from Greece and seeing stone buildings up and down 600 miles of river that, with all these processions and people celebrating and food and beer being distributed and it was probably just mind altering. I'm sure it was. We can see what happened. They started building in stone and so forth. So they used ritual as a way to uh, experience their divine. That, that somatic anchor that you were talking about. The somatic anchor, perfect co correlation. And they use and they love nature. So when their gods have animal heads, it's not because they're so primitive and they don't have philosophy like some of the early Egyptologists assumed. It's because they know everything about the crocodile. They know how it breathes. They know where it is. They know how it eats. They know how it raises its young. They know everything about that animal they've observed and taught for thousands of years. And so when the god has a crocodile head or a lioness head, it is imbuing that energy as the head, as the higher consciousness that it affects the entire deity. So that's who they're relating to. And then they were free. Find the one you relate to. Make your family shrine, your household shrine, the one you relate to. So the ones who, you know, there's these beautiful love poems of to, to Hathor from the miners who would go out into the desert to get the turquoise and the gold. And they would say, I cannot wait to be your beloved. I can't wait to join you into the, the eternal life and be your beloved. Hmm. They had that feeling, that really precious feeling. And, and there were periods when the decline of the culture was so dramatic that they began questioning it, but then they would come back, they would revive the parts of the culture that they knew from their observation and study and history and recording. They told the Greeks when they showed up, they said, you need to know your history about your culture. And somebody, you know, repeated the Odyssey and they're like, that's a myth. That's not your history. How can you make changes and how can you implement change in your culture without knowing your history start recording it start paying attention we can trace yeah. there's king lists that go all the way back to the beginning so they they knew these things were important so i really i think that's um you know we can look at this stuff and and it is reviving and when you visit if you ever get a chance to go i suggest you do when you walk into these temples and these tombs, 
you can feel it. They imbued so much ritual and energy and intention into these stone places that you can, if you go a little slow and you're not just being hurried through, you can actually really feel the presence of these beings. And you can see being an artist, knowing how hard it is to carve stone. You can see, you know, the cheek, it's all carved in a half a quarter of an inch. And you see the ripple of the cheek and the chin yes. and the, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's They're, amazing. Yeah. It's, and we, we get our filters because we don't, we're not given a little uh, preparation of here are the symbolisms you're seeing. It's a language. It's a visual language. We can learn to read it and then we can enjoy it more. And I think that's one of the problems that happens on the tours is they don't take the time to build that layer of knowing because it's so complicated it's so huge yeah yeah so, did i answer your question i kind of went afield yeah i mean i'm into it yeah i think i think you did yeah i think you are yeah okay. thank you i'd thank love you. to i could just listen i could just do this for days do you teach do you teach this is how i'm starting to teach i haven't i haven't been drawn to it until kind of this medium and being able to you know, I, I, with the the Patreon channel, I'm loving that and loving uh, the fall of civilizations. A great, you know, great listen. And then this um, this the emerald is so beautiful. So this is. is inspiring me. Well, I look forward to more, and I'm really glad that um, yeah, you're going back to the Neolithic. I think that's that's wonderful. Yeah. A wonderful place. I'd like to draw the draw from the well from. So. Thank you again. Thank you, Martin. I hope you get to both of those places. Um, I'm going to ask El Elric what happens next. Okay, we we unfortunately we have come up to the top of the hour, everyone. Um, uh, it feels like we could do this until the wee hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. I will offer um, an invitation. Um, that we can stay another 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm, I'm happy to stay with you. If you'd like to continue uh, having conversation, Lori, you're welcome to stay or not. You've worked very hard. You don't necessarily have to stay longer. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Um, I'd be happy to stay. Oh, okay. All right. So um, I want to thank Andrew. Andrew's going to um, pass the baton over to me. And um, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and um, I think we'll just continue now for another 15 minutes. Carol uh, Beauvais was going to be next. Carol? Okay. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm so... Uh, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to meet you and hear what your research has shown. And it resonates with the way I live and so many parts of me. Um, so hope to connect to you uh, in the future. What I, just to pick a, a one thing of <laughs> a million, um, I wonder yet if you have had fantasies, dreams, etc., of uh, rituals that actually learning so much from them, taking what you've learned and seeing what it would look like now. Like, for example, rituals. Mm -hmm. you ever fantasize what would a ritual look like now in, in this contemporary world? Or how would we even engage people into being interested in, see, I had three words, embodiment, ritual, and sacred, you know? So what would we put together to engage people in that way now? My suggestion as a mythologist and an artist is storytelling. Mm -hmm. And when you, it's like Michael Mead, you know, you go in and you storytell, and then the ritual comes. I'm a solo practitioner in my life. I've mm -hmm. kind of at 
Tan said, enough with this religious stuff. And it's, but it, the spiritual quality has remained. And so I think that what we see are these beautiful offerings. I think beauty is another one. I think incense, I think embodying, making sure that our practices, whatever we choose to do, is, is enlivening the creative, the beauty, and the senses uh, thoroughly so that we can um, have the experience, the embodied experience. I don't think it's so much going back and trying to recreate what they had. They used music, they used dance, they used beauty, they used food, they they probably used the blue lotus, which is a hallucinogen. They had uh, any number of practices themselves that we can put together. And some of the scholars do and write about it. Alison uh, Roberts, who's written a lot about Hawthorne, she's got four or five books about Hawthorne, it's fabulous. And so I think that the idea is to really find in you, use your creative practices, create active imaginations. When you are working with a group of people, find your companions, find the people. There's also people out there that if you like a more organized thing that have studied deeply, one is a woman who uh, runs the, it's uh, Academy for the Oracle Arts and she leads tours. She's been trained by indigenous uh, masters there in Egypt. And she has a beautiful organization, if that's something that calls to you more. And she do does classes on ritual. I tried it. I was like, I like what comes and wakes up in my heart. And so, and as far as the dreams and active imagination, absolutely. You start working with this stuff and they come. They start communicating. They're that close. They want, they're reaching out their hand. The divine, these energies, the ancestral, they're reaching out their hands. So do it. Thank you. Start it yourself. I do. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, T TG. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Sivia. Nice to be here. And thank you so much for this wonderful program. Um, I'm curious if there are connections uh, that you know about to Mesopotamian culture. I know that, for example, you know, in the Bible, Sarah and Abraham go to Egypt several times. The Hebrews end up in e Egypt. Um, that whole culture is based on Mesopotamian uh, gods and goddesses and rituals. So I'm just curious. Um, and then, you know, Hagar was from Egypt and um, you know, had a big part in the Abraham and Sarah story. So I'm just curious if there are connections with what you're studying and Mesopotamian culture and their gods and goddesses and Absolutely. priestesses. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have a view when we study history, they don't stress it enough. The Mediterranean basin was incredible. They were incredible traders. There were p people coming. They welcomed uh, outside merchants and, and traders to come and live within their city in the Delta region. So there was a lot of interchange, a lot more interflow. The daughters were being married off to the kings so that there was a lineage. They were fighting with one another, expanding borders. The New Kingdom period was an imperial uh, um era and they expanded borders and it was Ramses II who actually went into the Hittite culture and was battling with him and as early in his uh, reign and he said this is ridiculous he was so heartbroken with the loss of life and the destruction of these beautiful cultures that he said I gotta sue for peace I've got to pursue this path towards peace. It took him 14 years. The first peace treaty ever crafted that we have a copy of was with Ramses and the Hittite king. So yes, totally intermingled. I mentioned this earlier, the podcast Fall of Civilizations on um, Patreon, and they he covers that a lot. And he does it from a historian perspective, but he does a very thorough multimedia production now. And it's really lovely to go into that. And yes, it's in the 
<clears throat> it's in the it's in the Egyptology. We can see it in the artifacts. the The Minoans were what we call the Minoans. The Crete uh, population was incredibly uh, their artistry and their natural use of nature and so forth was uh, just loved. We find murals and remnants of murals made by Cretan artisans, and so there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of exchange, culture as well, because they always did. They, the old world, the ancient world, they went out and they said, oh, your God is that, that in our culture is this God, as opposed to going, oh, you have to believe in the one God or you're dead. No, they didn't have that. That's a new addition to our religious traditions. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I might just jump Thank in you. here. I might just jump in here if there isn't another raised hand at the moment. Um, you mentioned the opener of the way when you were speaking, I believe, about Maat. I, I now I, it's been a long time since I've read anything about Egyptology, but I have years past, and I seem to remember. And you can help me. I thought that Anubis was the opener of the way is this is this a function that trans that transfers from one to another they, they, like i said no hierarchy and what we have anubis is actually the opener of the way but a black jackal named wapawet is and it, he's seen so w e w a well, I can't spell it without seeing it. Uh, it Wapawet is the opener of the ways. When you're on the bow of the boat, uh, this is the position that the opener of the way, that the higher consciousness, her hand is out, and I am, I am interpreting, I am bringing, as a mythologist, it may not be Firm in the text, for the most part, I try to adhere to the archaeological evidence because I feel like that strengthens all of this. But I also take issue when something is um, being missed. And so Wapawet, Anubis is the, the funerary god. He helps with the corpse. He's actually considered the son, uh, the birth son of Nephthys, the two of them are in the underworld. They're performing the rituals. You'll see Anubis, beautiful male body, jackal head. Wapawet, you'll know it because he's actually a uh, fully jackal. You see him as the dog, the black jackal, and he's the opener of the way. So do you see this as a as, as a preparer of the way archetypally? It's, uh, it's one that goes before to open the way for for others is that kind of the I see that I, I see it exactly like a psychopomp. I mean they're really they're using the opener of the way they're using guides it's like that beautiful lament that I recited earlier that there's really an attempt to um to to assure us you know that we're spending so much time thinking about what is what is this ad adventure life is short where where am i going to go next and they really created a lot of detail you know we haven't really had a refresh uh of the of the imaginal cache i like to say the imaginal cache has been purged of the afterlife we really don't have something that resonates and is beautiful and calls to us as a as a reassuring like I could go. The nearest thing I found is the near death experiences, the reports that are coming back from the other side. Those are so powerful and they're so akin to this literature. I was mad. I was given a life review. I felt the presence of love. The, the, I didn't want to leave. You know, like this is really. Um, so so beautiful and so potent and so present in Egypt. So I feel like we're, I feel like the practices are returning, the things are returning, the information is being unburied, and we're being prepared for a new age. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask or a comment they'd like to make? Can you raise your hand if you'd like to do that? I see some beautiful faces there of beloved yeah. friends. Hello, Pam and Christian. 
Well, I'll make, I'll, I'll make one quick last, if no one else has anything. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the, uh, that moment that you mentioned with um, Kepri, uh -huh. uh, the power of Kepri. And I wondered about the alchemical uh, association with that moment in, in alchemy, Western alchemy of the albedo, that moment just before the sun rises. Is that mm -hmm. a correlation? It's totally. And they really, there was a denial. There was a very uh, prominent Egyptologist, who German uh, gentleman who just recently passed. And he was just like adamant. There was no initiation. The, the mysteries were open for everyone. There was it's what you see is what you get. It was done in ceremony. And what we know when we look at the images in many of the tombs that preserved the working with copper came before even the historical period. So they they had a lot of the things that come into alchemy and alchemy was really well established when the Hellenist period started, which, which was 300 BC. Alexander the Great arrived and created Alexandria and it was a great learning center and the library was all the people from all over. That had already been going on since about 1200, maybe even 1500 BC. So very well developed. And, and so a lot of the imagery, a lot of the wisdom, a lot of even the, the chemistry practices came out of Egypt. They knew, you know, they had glass blowing, they had metal working, they worked with jewels and gems, and they understood the principles. And then they brought their own, we don't even know to this day, how they built the pyramids. It cannot be duplicated, the precision. And we, you know, they had what, bronze axes? Like, I don't think so. Yeah. So there's something there that they were able, and we know little snippets of, they would send a high priest with a quarry team down the river, 600 miles to Aswan and to Southern Upper Egypt. And they would quarry out these huge blocks of stone for these enormous sarcophagus. And they would bring them back. And before you do that, you gotta know they're solid. And there's one that had been quarried and that could not be, uh, was not completed because it was, um, it was fractured in the center. It wouldn't have withstood that. And they knew it from toning it. They had medical texts. They, they knew all about the circulatory system. They knew about the heart. They could tone a body. They could read pulses. When you were sick in the Mediterranean basin and you were a king, you sent to Egypt for your medical doctor. You didn't want anyone else touching you. And they combined, they dismissed it within scholarship because it combined magical, like what the heck does that have to do? A cat tail or a you know frog leg or like, oh, uh, they're so primitive. And we just got stuck in seeing them in this way when in fact they saw how it all goes together, that they're sympathetic magic. And that if you drink this magical brew, as well as let me discern and diagnose what's actually happening, we can get you well. It was a holistic approach, which is so different from ours. Yeah. You're really getting that. You've really seen that. So it's the first, it, it's really the first primary thing we, we need to see. I know that um, someone spoke, of, meant, asked you about uh, the, the interaction between Egypt and um, how it how it interacted with Judaism and so forth. You see in Judaism in the in the traditions of Judaism all these echoes of Egypt, just throughout. We're right there. I yeah. mean, Egypt, Palestine. You know where the Levant. The you know they're right there. They they marched. Um, it was a couple of kings before Ramses II marched his troops and and claimed land all the way to Euphrates. I mean, it was it was an intermingled, really rich culture. I wish I I wish I had a little time machine and I could go back a little language translator so I could speak fifteen languages. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Because we might just wrap up if we don't I, have. I, I do have a question, but I don't have a hand. So. Oh well, well there oh. you are. There you are. Um, they didn't. They didn't give me a hand. These little 
orange hand. Okay, Elliot, um, you're on. <laughs> I, like, first of all, this has just been the most amazing, amazing presentation. I, I'm just, uh, there's so much, so rich, so overflowing, and somewhat heretical, I might say. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I, I, you know, I, I want to go back to originally, you know, the idea of chaos and, and the idea of um, what, you know, what we can do in these times and the idea of, of the earth calling out. And um, I, uh, I come from a, a tradition, I'm pagan, and have done with many other pagans rituals for decades, many of my fellow pagans, ISIS worshipers, as I was myself. I've called out to Ma'at for justice in my ceremonies, in my rituals, but they're only private. And as opposed to depth psychology, the healing of the individual, which I know Jung is all about, I'm not, you know, I mean, I'm, I love Jung, but I'm into healing the culture and healing the society. And what Carol Bove was pointing to is what my question was, the Egyptians, you say, you state, were able to sustain and regenerate. Well, it's because they had temples. <laughs> they had temples, they had gods, they had religion that, that, uh, that, that sustained them for thousands of years. It was not, it was always changing. There was the dissolution. It was the first kingdom, the second kingdom, third, there was all, you know, you know, chaos would come in, it would destroy everything. It would go back and forth, but they always kept the gods. Alexander was another, he conquered the world, but he kept the temples. Yes. How do we create a culture in which there are temples to Ma'at, temples to order? temples to uh you know the the you know create rituals that are musical yeah that's what we tried to do it didn't do any good but you because the culture is all doing together. something else the uh, the you culture is doing to, some kind of these yeah you can you just need you need to partner up with carol you need to find your companions in the bark you need to create the rituals and 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 invite people to participate and people will come you know there and maybe it looks different than having a temple and having the ceremonies and a ceremonial calendar maybe it looks different maybe it's like uh you know one of the the rituals we need in this culture more than anything is grief we do grief awful you know five days person's gone boom get back to work go, carry on with your life and whoa, how can we even think of that? So you've got to find the place where your heart is called. This is the one thing I'd really love to stress is that when your heart is called, wake it up and put it to action. Don't hold back. Do, do mot, say mot, be mot in the world. And 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 just bring in the the people one by one, even if you only touch three people's lives, that would be a huge offering because if we work individually, if we work on our own shadow and digesting our own heartache, we get to model that, put that into the world. They worked on the energy levels and that was what kept them alive and kept them going. And when something collapsed, they went back and said, what had energy? Where can I bring that in? So I just, you know, we each of us have to find what we can do. There are going to be people who know how to go out and talk about the climate and wake people up. You and Carol could talk about ritual and how important it is to our well-being. And we just, we, and, and we build networks. And we've got this social media, let's use it for the betterment as opposed to the, you know, it's like an apophis inertia. Let's put out into the world these things that can wake us up. Did that, oh, was that you. inspiring? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I just I have one little, one little thing. Now, where can I get some of that blue lotus, by the way? <laughs> Google it. Look up for it online. That was a joke. I, that was a joke. I saw that video where they were talking about, you know, they found out it was a hallucinogen. And all. Yeah. No, you can use it. They sell it as a tea, and it, and it uh -huh. has mildly 
you know, I've never tried a huge, big old dose of it, but it has mild, relaxing beauty. Oh. You, could, you could incorporate that into a ritual and make it part. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Thank you. My friends, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, I feel like we could we could do this for days. Lori. A jamma party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you, Lori. This was really, really rich and 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 uh, and soul feeding, and uh, we so appreciate you. And I want to thank everybody who stayed with us through the whole thing and and a little longer. Thank you all for being here. Yes, and, uh, we'll, well, hope, we'll hope to see you uh, next month. Okay. Good night, everyone. Blessings. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.